Good afternoon. Let's have a little uh, technological moment while I find my presentation. Yep. Okay. We hope we're there. So, yes, Tim, Tim uh, invited me and reminded me of this um, speech I did in, uh, in Bellaria, in a sort of uh, deserted, out-of-season seaside resort in Italy. It was a very strange place. And he said, uh, you gave a very mordant speech. Um, and I wasn't really sure what he was saying. Mordant, is that like deathly? Um, and in, I had look, looked it up. Sorry, do you want to come and uh, help? Um, that should work, but... Okay, okay, okay. Thank um, you. Mordant really means um, biting, acerbic, scathing, piercing. These are wonderful words in, in English. Um, so what he's looking for and what he's going to get um, and what you will be getting is um, some critique. Um, a conference is always a bit like a celebration, a party, and you can, you can regard me as the sort of embarrassing guest who will get drunk and say lots of unpopular, embarrassing things because I want to be challenging. I want to provoke some, some disagreement because I think we need some more debate. So if I haven't said at least one thing that you really disagree with, then I haven't done my job properly. So mordant is what you ask for. Mordant is what you will get. Um, I must have been feeling a little bit positive when I, I dreamed up this title, um, and I'm not sure I will answer these questions. Um, what I'm going to do is to start with the UK um, and some lessons, I think, from what has happened in the UK. And then I'm going to scope out to Europe and the world and, and the universe. Um, and what, what I want to do is to identify some obstacles and some problems in how we think about media literacy, particularly at the level of policy. Um, but you'll be pleased to know at the end I will try to come back and be more positive in thinking about where do we go from here. I probably need to begin by just saying a little bit briefly about where I'm coming from. Um, I'm obviously coming from the UK, and in fact, really, a lot of what I'm talking about is about England. Um, the education system, for example, in Scotland um, is very different. Um, I'm talking mainly about um, formal education, at least that's my main concern, what goes on in schools. I think there is a whole other story to tell about adults and also about informal education, and I may touch on that, but that's not my main concern. Um, we have a long history. Um, probably you can date back media education 80 years. It means I can pull out an image like this from 1959, uh, a publication for teachers teaching about um, media, film primarily, in schools. When we talk about media education, we are talking primarily, and this is just important to, to define, we're talking here about teaching about media, not with or through media. So media education, as far as I'm concerned, is not about using computer games to teach science, or e-twinning, or using media as tools, or indeed media making as a means of promoting citizenship, or a creative process for its own sake. It's not primarily about training people for employment in the media industries. All of those things are fine, but in my view, it only becomes what I would call media education when it involves critical study, critical analysis of media. It's not just about the use of media, um, it's also about teaching critically about media. Media literacy, and I will say a lot more about this as we go along, media literacy for me means the outcome of media education. A media educated person is a media literate person. But over the last 10 or 15 years, media literacy has come to mean something rather different. Thirdly, media studies. In the UK, we have a specialist subject at the top end of secondary schools called media studies. Students follow a specialized course from 
or they can follow a specialized course from the age of 14 and then onwards from 16 to, to 18. And obviously it's still a growing subject in higher education. It's also there in the mainstream curriculum, in, in uh, the subject of English, the teaching of mother tongue language. Um, so on one level, you could look, and people sometimes do, look to the UK as a, a kind of success story. You know, you're doing very well. You have well-established um, media education happening. Um, but I think important to say that media education, we feel, is still quite marginal. Probably only about 10% of students will follow those specialized courses at the top of the secondary school. Um, it's also vilified by politicians. For politicians, for some media commentators, media education, media studies is just a big joke. It's a Mickey Mouse subject, ha ha. Um, it's all about dumbing down, it's all about teaching um, children to the lowest common denominator, as people like to say. And I think also important to, to note that it continued, continues to be under threat over the past few weeks, I've been involved in a, a consultation with um, the examining bodies. Really, we're involved in a struggle to hang on to, to defend those specialised courses. It's not at all clear that those specialised courses are going to survive with our new government. It's also important to say that media, teaching about media, has pretty much disappeared from the subject of English, from mother tongue language teaching. There was a recent consultation document um, for the English curriculum that contained the line, digital texts will not be permitted. And you think, you know, what kind of world are these people in? How can that possibly make sense? But certainly to some of our education policy makers, that is where we are going. Now that focus on, on literacy, that mention of literacy is, is important. Um, and I have a few things I want to say about that. Certainly media educators have always looked to the subject of English, to mother tongue language teaching. Um, that's partly strategic. English is a well-established subject in our curriculum. It's a safe place. Um, but I think it's also part of an argument that in a way there is no logic for separating media or print media, as we would call them, from other kinds of media. There's no logic for separating literacy from media literacy. And certainly as time goes by, as everything becomes digital and mediated, um, that logic, that logic for separation is really disappearing. So in a way, you could say, the argument that we're making is a broader argument. It's a, an argument for redefining, rethinking how we teach about communication and culture in the modern world. So in that context, this alignment with literacy, thinking about media in terms of language, is a very important thing um, to be doing. However, if media is going to meet, or are going to meet literacy in Warsaw, we need to think about how literacy itself is being defined, and I would say redefined, in many education systems. Again, a bigger story to tell, but in the UK, partly in response to what some people call a literacy panic, a fear of declining levels of traditional literacy, literacy itself is being defined in ever narrower ways. Um, it's being defined in a way not so much as being about books and print, but about a particular approach to teaching reading about something that's called synthetic phonics. And my image here, this phonics workbook, interestingly, these are produced by a company, commercial company, that markets its teaching materials into schools. And interestingly, the person who uh, runs that company is also one of the government's leading advisors on literacy. So what we have here is a model of literacy which is not really about a broader socio-cultural view, but actually about um, functional skills, literacy redefined in a very narrow way. Media literacy, I think, is something that appeared in the UK on the policy agenda not much more than, than 10 years ago. 
Um, it's become a theme in policy and practice internationally. And in many cases, I have a sense that people have looked to the UK, they've looked to what the media regulator, Ofcom, has done in the UK for models of how to promote media literacy. Well, I would say maybe you shouldn't be doing that. Um, there's a short history here. Uh, this is our former culture minister, um, Tessa Jowell, as well as being responsible for media literacy, she was also responsible for gambling. Um, and little less than, little more than 10 years ago, she said, I believe that in the modern world, media literacy, you probably can't see this, sorry, media literacy will become as important a skill as maths or science. Decoding our media will be as important to our lives as citizens as understanding great literature is to our cultural lives. And I can remember the conference at which um, she spoke and, and talked about this. An extraordinary moment, really, for us, those of us who've spent decades pushing for media education. Come forward no more than five years. 2009, the government publishes a report called Digital Britain, and it refers to media literacy as a technocratic and specialist term understood by policymakers, but not really part of everyday language. And what, uh, early in the day of this report, was going to be a national plan for media literacy, eventually became a national plan for digital participation. So you can see across not much more than five years, the emergence and then really the demise, the death of media literacy as a, as a theme. Now, how did that happen? Well, we had a, a Communications Act in 2003 that gave Ofcom, the new converged media regulator, responsibility for promoting media literacy. And there's an interesting story which I can't go into. I have a, a, um, a research student, a uh, former research student, uh, Richard Wallace, who tracked this whole uh, policy process in great detail. It seemed as though media literacy had really come from nowhere, or certainly media literacy was a term not widely used in the UK, it was more of an American term, um, and there's a, a long story about this which we've, we've written about. Um, I think it's important to say that when it came into the law in uh, the 2003 Act, it was in a context that was very much about deregulation. It was very much about leaving the media to the operations of the free market. Now, there are various ways of understanding what was going on here. I mean, you could see, on one level, media literacy as being about empowering the consumer, giving people themselves the tools to make sense of their media environment, to, to make sense of their experience as media users. But I think you can also see media literacy as a shift away from an old style of centralized state regulation to a form of self-regulation where consumers, and certainly Ofcom talked about this couplet, the citizen consumer, but the emphasis was very much on the consumer. The idea that the consumer would regulate themselves. This, in a way, without going into it, is, is a classic example of what Michel Foucault talks about um, as governmentality, the idea that government in modern societies is no longer so much about the imposition of central control within neoliberal societies. I don't think Foucault would use that word. Within neoliberal societies, there is a shift from centralized control by the state to self-control by the individual. People have to learn to regulate themselves, to survey themselves, to control their own media use. And media literacy needs to be understood, I think, in that context. Some people have called this responsabilization, making the consumer responsible, because the state no longer wishes to be responsible in this commercialized media environment. Now the consumer, the user, is responsible for regulating their own media behavior. Now what we see following this story um, from 2003 across um, the, the decade, what we find is that media literacy narrows, and it narrows to two main preoccupations. Firstly, um, internet safety, and secondly, 
uh, what gets called e-inclusion. One of uh, my student, um, Richard Wallace's interviews was with Robin Blake, who was the head of media literacy at Ofcom. He said, media literacy has become a matter of internet safety and getting grannies online, he said. And in a way, it, it sums it up, really. Um, importantly, media education, mo media literacy moves a long way away from education from a formal educational process. And it also becomes, strangely, about just digital media. So there's a whole other story that one could tell about the UK and the failure, really, to, to regulate the press, the printed press in the UK. But Ofcom's agenda is, is narrower than that. So how did that narrowing happen? How did it come to be defined in this way? Well, I think to a large extent it was a matter of not being clearly defined in the beginning. Now, to some extent, we can say, well, you know, strategically, that makes sense. If you want to build a consensus around an idea, if you define it too specifically, then, you know, the, the danger is that you will lose people. Um, so there was a kind of strategic lack of definition going on here. I think a key issue, though, was that it was also made a matter of concern for the regulator for the media regulator and not for education. The Minister of Education, the Department for Education, had other concerns and actually had a very different notion of literacy. There was very little connection, um, very little joining up between what was going on in communications policy and what was happening in education policy. Meanwhile, the whole issue of internet safety comes on the agenda and very much the concern for government is how are we seen to respond to these emerging panics? What do we do about paedophiles and pornography on the internet? And there is a whole push behind the internet safety industry um, from corporations that want to show how responsible they're being um, to promote um, internet safety, e-safety. And media literacy increasingly comes to be aligned with that. What's also quite striking through this history is how the industry, the media industries themselves, are really quite suspicious of media literacy. They're quite happy to have little projects where kids make television programs. They will certainly sign up to internet safety. Nobody's not, nobody's going to refuse that. They're interested in digital skills, often defined in a narrowly functional way. But that is about as far as they want to go. And they're very suspicious of this idea of teaching people to be critical about media. I think at the end of the day, the question we have to ask is, does government really want critical media literacy, media education? Despite um, Tessa Jowell and the quotation I read you uh, earlier on, the last government, certainly, that we've had since, since 2010, and this government we now have, is actually trying pretty hard to write media education out of the formal curriculum. So we end up in a situation where media literacy seems to be something really quite different from media education. Media education, as I understand it, is a broad-ranging process of learning about culture and communication. It might well have a creative element as well as a critical element, but that element of critical thinking, critical engagement, is absolutely crucial. Media literacy might mean a number of different things, but in the UK at least, media literacy increasingly came to mean internet safety and functional skills. Now, I'm not saying that internet safety and functional skills are not important, um, I think the whole thing about access and e-inclusion, there's a whole other discussion, although I would say that I think it's a much broader discussion than simply about functional skill. There are important questions to ask about motivation, about context, um, although the question of e-inclusion is often defined in very narrow and functional terms. The whole question of safety, again, I think is driven often by moral crusaders who are quite possessed by their, their mission to save children from evil content on the internet. But what they often do is promote a kind of fantasy 
of control, an illusory idea of control that actually tells us rather more about the contemporary politics of childhood, the symbolic functions of ideas about childhood. From an educational point of view, I would say that teaching internet safety is a very simple and straightforward task. It's something probably best done in the context of social education, and it is something that is already being done. Children are already being bored to death by being warned about online risk. Media education, I would say, is something much broader than that. Okay, some mordant uh, comments about uh, the European context. Um, I think what we find in, in Europe is very much this sense of media literacy as an alternative to regulation. Here's Viviane Redding, I hope you can see this, who was the, the uh, Information and Communication Commissioner, um, making a very similar kind of argument, in a way, to our minister in the UK. Media literacy is crucial for achieving full and active citizenship. Traditional literacy is no longer sufficient. Everyone needs to get to grips with the new digital world. We need continuous information and education. This is more important than regulation. And there's a, there's a history here that I'm sure other people will be, be talking about. I, I quite like, I couldn't resist um, this particular image. Um, and what I was talking about in, in Bilaria, I think, was at least a diversity of definitions of media literacy, if not perhaps a confusion of different aims and different perspectives. Um, a history really up to about 2010, so up to about five years ago, my sense is that there were a series of moves, a series of, of documents, communications, recommendations, um, a big move by the Commission to get media literacy on the agenda, to have that discussion about definitions and approaches, to put the key actors in contact with each other. My sense is that that initiative has dissipated somewhat. It's partly about where media literacy has moved within the Commission. Um, there's a bit of a danger that media literacy has now become an element of a lot of other initiatives and in the process has become rather diffuse. It runs the risk of being everywhere but nowhere. Um, I think also it's a question of what is the responsibility of the Commission of Europe as compared with the responsibility of national states? And I think one of the big issues, of course, is that education is very much a responsibility of member states. It's very difficult for policy at a European level to actually make member states do anything in the field of, of education. So there's a sense in which a transnational body, the Commission, rather reaches the limits of what it can achieve in promoting um, an educational policy here. Um, I would say to be a, a, even more mordant here, I, I find a, a, a worrying tendency um, at the European level to be this preoccupation with measurement, with identifying assessment criteria, um, measuring the idea that we can measure levels of media literacy in different member states. Quite a lot of money, quite a lot of effort has been spent in that direction. Now, I think that's understandable. Um, I think initiatives have to be justified by showing that they work, that they make a difference. But I think there is a real problem when it comes to measuring media literacy, particularly when you're measuring critical understanding or creativity. There's a danger always that you measure what can easily be measured. So when the UK regulator Ofcom measures media literacy, generally what it measures is access to media, use of media. It finds it very difficult, for obvious reasons, to measure critical understanding and creativity. So there is a danger if we obsess about measurement that we end up measuring some very limited things. There is also, going from that, a, a danger that we end up instrumentalizing literacy. We measure literacy in terms of a set of skills rather than a set of social practices. And I think on a policy level, there is a question about you know, what you do with that information. When you discover that 
I don't know, you know, media literacy in Slovenia is 37.2, but in Finland it's 46.9, or perhaps the other way around. You know, what, what, what do you do with that information? How useful is that information? So I think there is a bit of a problem, not so much with measurement per se, but with focusing a lot of energy on measurement. The other thing I perceive happening at this policy level, both in the UK and um, at a European level, is the push towards an emphasis on film. So increasingly we're talking about film literacy rather than media literacy. At a European level, that is partly driven by globalization and by a concern about European cultural heritage. The imperative comes to be about building audiences for European produced films. And there's a kind of assumption here, which you might want to think about, that a more media literate audience will somehow demand, be more likely to want European produced films, more European films, less Hollywood films. I'm personally not so sure about that. In the UK, we've also had a big push and actually quite a lot of government money spent on film education, um, which is fine, but for me, film education is a small aspect of media education. And often, the focus on film education goes along with a kind of cultural elitism, this kind of mystical rhetoric about the magic of film, this fetishizing of cinema going. It's strange, actually, that film seems to have finally achieved a kind of legitimacy in a way that's almost prehistoric. You know, the idea that somehow we consider film in isolation with other media seems increasingly strange in the, in the 21st century. So we have film literacy and a lot of push behind that, and we have digital literacy in various forms. Digital literacy focusing largely on technical questions and questions about safety. And my question here is, well, you know, what happens in the middle there? Film literacy is addressing cultural questions, digital literacy driven largely by a technological agenda, and a lot of other things like television, you remember television, um, and also the broader critical perspective, somehow disappearing into the gap between film literacy and digital literacy. And I, I'm sure that Matteo and others will have some, some ways to come back to me about this. Okay. For, more, more mordant uh, observations, because I'm moving out from Europe now to the global perspective and, and, for, and to, to say a little bit about UNESCO, because I've actually done, I've done work for UNESCO, I was doing some work for UNESCO about 15 years ago about media literacy. Um, I've also done some work for the, the UN even a bit before that. And one thing that at least I find interesting is the way in which within these organizations, there is a long history of interest in media education, but almost what I would call a kind of institutional amnesia, that they've forgotten a lot of that history. So when I came to do a review of media literacy in about uh, 2001, I think it was, I discovered that actually somebody had done a review a couple of years earlier, and actually when you look back, UNESCO has been doing reviews of media literacy many, many times over the years. UNESCO most recently has, has produced a declaration about media literacy, and again, I think UNESCO runs into the difficulty that the European Commission also has, which is how does a transnational body of this kind really um, address itself to national governments? How can it possibly make a change to national governments? How, does it, how is it, at the end of the day, anything more than just a talking shop, a matter of people expressing good intentions that don't go anywhere? Well, the way in which UNESCO has reformulated this, and I think it's worth um, thinking about, is not so much media literacy, but media and information literacy, M-I-L. Um, and it's kind of inclusive, you know, everything is there on one level. I mean, information literacy is an interesting concept and you might want to think about how those things go together. Information literacy seems to come from a rather different place. It's often a responsibility for different kinds of people. It embodies, I think, different theoretical perspectives. I'm not sure that media literacy 
and information literacy necessarily fit very well together. There's no obvious place for information literacy, for example, in European policy, or in our case in the UK, in national policy. Where is information literacy? And I also worry, in a sense, about what's missing here. Um, information, the notion of information for me, implies a kind of narrowing, that we're talking about factual media, we're talking about things like news. The danger is that we lose sight of the cultural dimensions of media. We lose sight of fiction and fantasy, which are all obviously crucial parts of people's media experience. And instead, what we look at is information retrieval. A further worry I have is that information literacy implies a kind of elision between um, an elision with information and communication technology. Now, that might be strategic, but the whole field of ICT seems to me very much driven by a focus on technical skills. Currently, it's all about coding, um, you know, file management, algorithms, computational thinking, and of course, inevitably, internet safety. Now, having said that, actually, UNESCO's um, media and information literacy curriculum is really quite broadly framed. And if you haven't seen these documents, I would urge you to have, have a look at them. A lot of the content focus is on journalism and news, but there's also really interesting stuff about the political economy of media. I'm sure there are other people who will want to set me straight on those comments as well. Okay, so where are we going here? Um, what, are, what are the problems? I think, first of all, just to kind of sum this up, what we see in all of this is, I think, a kind of confusion of aims. And I look back to what I said in Bellaria, and I had a great long list of all of these things that media literacy or media education was supposed to achieve. It was supposed to bring about active citizenship, creativity, it was supposed to preserve the cultural heritage, it was supposed to promote inclusion and participation. It was also about critical literacy, technological skill, child protection, etc. I put world peace in here, and I'm not joking. When I look at the United Nations um, Alliance of Civilizations initiative on media, uh, on media literacy, it seems to me, you know, there's an element of the idea that somehow media literacy will promote um, world peace and, you know, dialogue between civilizations. Now, you know, all of those things are lovely, of course, but the danger is that we get them all confused together in this well-meaning, um, slightly mushy um, concoction, and also we have enormous expectations for what media literacy can possibly achieve. And when you think about these things, very often we're talking about different uh, contexts, different actors, different people involved, um, different settings, different kinds of outcomes. And there is a danger that we, we just kind of confuse all of these things. And we, we think we're all talking about the same thing when actually we're not. So I think that's the first problem. And I think, I'm afraid, that problem is still with us. I think there is also, I've identified in what I've said, a kind of confusion of content. You know, are we talking about media broadly? Are we talking about film? Are we talking about the internet, digital, social media? Are we talking about information? Um, what, what's going on? I think there is a problem that we take, if we take particular bits of this and we don't look at a bigger picture, because the, the real world is one in which all of these things are interconnected. Um, and the danger is that a lot of what is important disappears if we focus more narrowly. A further concern I have, um, oh yes, so my question is, you know, on one level, yes, and I, I, was, I slightly took it to heart when Tim was speaking at the beginning. So David Buckingham's going to offer us a definition. Well, David Buckingham isn't going to offer you <laughs> a definition. I, you know, I'm not sure that actually if we arrived at a simple definition, it would be very useful. Um, Ofcom, the regulator, went through a whole process of consultation, arrived at a definition which people pretty much agreed with, but it was such a broad and inoffensive definition that it, it didn't really help. And I'm not sure either, and again, I'm afraid as I look to the European context, the, the European Commission has spent a lot of money on people producing elaborate theoretical models of media literacy, which are quite questionable, some of them, I would say. So I'm not sure 
I really want to go to any more meetings where people sit around in endless discussions, going in round and round in circles about what do we mean by media literacy. Um, I've had enough, I'm sorry. Um, and, and a final grumpy comment is about what I would call the blanding of media literacy. Um, this is where I get to be very um, unpopular. I, I spoke to my friend uh, Ben Bachmeier, who's a German professor who's done a lot of work on media literacy. He said to me, you know, media, media literacy is a bit like a wellness club. He said, and I know exactly what he means. A lot of the discourse about media literacy is bland, it's normative, it's boring, it's moralistic, it, it's sanctimonious. It's about creating good, responsible little citizens. It's about children keeping their nose clean. It's safe. It is very safe and very boring. And for me, you know, I'm too old probably, but you know, when I came into this, media, education, teaching about media used to be about political dissent. It used to be about challenge. It used to be subversive. It used to be oppositional. I wanted to find you an example of, of this, and there is a European example, which I was very tempted to use, and then I thought, no, I, I'm not gonna go there. But actually, I'm gonna put something up on my blog, probably tonight, and you can see what I'm, I'm talking about. I'm being a bit cowardly here. Um, and you may well see this example, um, probably tomorrow. Um, it's actually easier to find American examples, and this is one, I don't know if you can, if you can see this, but here we have a model of the digital citizen. You know, the digital citizen um, is safe. The digital citizen looks after their private information. The digital citizen stands up to cyberbullying. Um, the digital citizen uses their personal device only for educational purposes. The digital citizen makes sure that they only access safe and appropriate content. Um, now, this is interesting. It's not just about porn and paedophiles anymore. Um, and in fact, behind a lot of this discourse, if you look at a lot of it, a lot of it is about ideas about pathological addiction. Um, it's based often on, I think, rather spurious ideas from brain science um, and ideas, simplistic ideas about media effects. What it does is to pose media literacy as a mental health issue. It individualizes media literacy. It conceives of media literacy in almost evangelical terms. And the politics of it, I'm afraid, I find very, very problematic. Now, you might say I'm just, you know, I'm stuck in the radical fantasies of the 1970s, um, you know, but I just want nothing whatsoever to do with this. I'm sorry. Um, so you can read more on my blog where I'm, I'm actually even more um, outspoken. Okay, um, so I thought I should, as I move to the end, I'm not sure how long I've got, maybe five minutes, yeah, maybe. Um, uh, might be a little longer, I'll do my best. Okay, um, you know, as if to prove that I am this hopeless old lefty, um, I dug up some political slogans. Um, you won't recognize this one probably, but this is, uh, this is Chairman Mao. You know, I, I mean, one thing I could say is let, let a hundred flowers bloom. Let a hundred schools of thought contend that actually this diversity of definitions isn't a problem, it's actually very healthy. I, I'm not sure it turned out too well for, for Chairman Mao, um, but you know, that would be one way of thinking about it. Another way, a thing, that's, thing that we used to say in the 1970s, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, that's, that's Gramsci. I mean, I've been involved in this attempt to promote and extend media education for, well, 35 years at least. I, I was very, very young when I started. And it has always been an uphill struggle. And I have to say at the moment, things look from where I'm standing to be very bleak and very depressing. Um, and yes, the result of our election um, just recently didn't make me overjoyed in this respect either. Um, we've had some moments of success, but actually we've, we, are, we are in some, some difficulty. Um, we've been involved, I think in particular, in pursuit of policy change, as though somehow if we got the policy right up there, then everything would follow from that. And a lot of energy has gone into influencing that process of policy change that I'm not so sure 
has been very productive. So my third way, and sorry, there's no, <laughs> no reference to Tony Blair there whatsoever. Um, my, my, rep, my third way is this. It's, um, it's the uh, scientist and environmentalist René Dubot, which is think globally, act locally. That if, if there's a slogan I want you to take away, it would probably be that, really. Um, I had another one from Gramsci, actually. This, I really like these things. The challenge of modernity is to live without illusions and without becoming disillusioned. And the thing is, Gramsci had such good hair, don't you think? Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. So, think globally, act locally. Um, the, the Evans Foundation and the Evans Prize, and actually, to be entirely fair, a lot of the work of the European Commission has been on exchanging and, and disseminating practice. And I think this is really important. If I, was, if I had money to spend here, I would not spend any more money on measuring devices or you know, models of media literacy. I would spend my money on documenting and exchanging practice and enabling practitioners to come together and do that. And that's exactly the purpose, as I understand it, at this conference. That's what you're going to be doing over these two days. Now, of course, there's a lot of, there's good and bad, um, but I think there is a lot of challenging, exciting, relevant, motivating stuff out there. And I, I certainly hope I'm going to be seeing a lot of that in the next couple of days. Um, these images come from a, a, um, a project I was involved with over, uh, recently completed over three years. Um, and we recently ended up producing some teaching materials coming from this project with a couple of organisations in the UK, the Centre for Literacy in Primary Education and the English Media Centre. What we were trying to do was to map out what kids should know about media at different ages and trying to use practical approaches in classrooms, not using fancy cutting edge technology, but to do things that were perfectly accessible for mainstream teachers. Now, I, I can't go into detail um, about that, but I, I think one thing I would say is, and one of the exciting things about it for me, is what we found was that this could actually be done with very young kids. And in many ways, for me, the most exciting things that came out of this project were to do with the younger age group, with primary school kids. And I ended up thinking, well, you know, if younger kids can do this, if eight-year-olds can do this, then let's think, you know, if they had media education all the way through, what would they be capable of achieving, you know, 10 years on from that? If, if younger kids can engage with media studies concepts and questions actually to a very high level, if they can think critically and also generate really interesting creative practice, then let's think what it would be like if they had that opportunity. This was a fundamental entitlement of education all the way through their school career. I, I hate this kind of thing, really, these kind of you know, models and whatever, having, <laughs> having been very negative. But you know, we have our own model, you know, and this is just a very cut down version. If you want to know more, I put some of this stuff on my blog as well, and the teaching materials are, are published. Um, we have examples, um, but I also think what we have is a pretty clear framework. We have a pretty clear sense, a definition, a way of thinking through what is happening here that continues to be persuasive and relevant. And we have teaching materials that allow teachers to put that into practice in ways that I think we can safely say kids find engaging um, and challenging. Okay, I think this may be the last slide, yeah? And then I'll be done. So, I mean, on one level, you know, I've tried to be a little bit positive at the end. Um, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Um, I mean, you can take a, a long view. I, I think the argument for media education is urgent and it's necessary. And in a sense, none of you would be here if you didn't believe that, and I don't need to tell you it again. But I would say that despite the growing importance of media in all our lives, this argument seems to be more and more difficult to make. I think we're making this argument now, and certainly perhaps I just speak for the UK, but I think this is a, a broader phenomenon. We're making this argument in a difficult political climate, in a climate when education has become politically symbolic in a way that is very damaging 
for education itself, for how we think about literacy, and for how we think about media literacy. Education has become caught up in a kind of political symbolism about where the world is going in a way that I think is very damaging. But to take the long view, I think it is implausible that we will not have some form of media education in 20 years time. You know, we're talking about the primary means of communication of the 20th century. Can we really ignore these in the 21st century? So, where are we going and how can we get there? I, I'm not sure I've answered that question. I, I think I've said where I don't want to go, and I think the rest of the world is heading there, and I don't want to go there. Um, how can we get there? Well, oh, sorry, sorry. How can we get there? Well, my feeling is that actually the search for policy, for a policy mandate, is, if not completely illusory, certainly runs the risk of being a distraction. And my preference at this point would be to say, let's work on practice. Let's document, let's share instances of practice. Let's, at the same time, of course, critically examine practice. But let's put practitioners, teachers, those who work with young people and young people themselves at the centre of this discussion. So, that was my final um, political slogan uh, for the day. And uh, if you want to go and have a look at my website and my blog, uh, that's where it is. And I'll be posting something controversially uh, probably tonight or tomorrow morning, and then I'll go and jump on the plane. <laughs> Thank you.